Yeah, so um, we are very happy to have Harrison Chen from Cornell University here today to speak in our algebra seminar about uh, coherence uh, Springer theory and categorical Deleuze language. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, so this uh, this is a joint work with uh, David, three Davids, uh, Benzi, Hellman, Nadler. Uh, and, okay. So uh, I'd like to start out by giving a little bit of context to the problem. Um, so this is going to be finite Springer theory, and then in a, just sort of an overview, I'll move on to sort of some recent developments in affine Springer theory, and then I'll talk about our work, which is called coherent Springer theory, and then I'll talk a bit about methods. So um, okay, so what's so it's maybe the semi I don't know pseudo historical introduction to Springer theory. Um, the sort of motivation here is to sort of try to uh, just sort of study representations of, of Chevrolet groups. So what the, what's that mean? If I if I take a reductive group, um, there's a problem. You could try to classify irreducible representations of that group um, with finite coefficients. So these are just finite groups. So uh, and then compute the characters of the irreducibles. And um, one might learn in an introductory uh, course in representation theory that one could try to induce from subgroups, but in this sort of more structured setting, one can do a little better, which is you can do parabolic induction. What that means is, okay, so I'm only going to think about, I'm just going to do one example. Um, so just fix a Borel. So if the group is GLN, the Borel, okay, so for example, if G is GLN, the Borel is just going to be the upper triangular matrices and the Levy quotient, uh, well, it's going to be a torus. And then one, 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 what one can do is sort of inflate representations of the torus to the Borel. Um, so uh, that's just pulling back. And then one can induce those representations of the group. And then we can rephrase the problem as sort of decomposing the induced this sort of in this parabolically induced representation into uh, sort of symbols and then compute the characters there. Wait, uh, there's yeah. a question. Hold on. Are you going to work over the complex numbers throughout the uh, So are you, did you hear, are you working over the complex numbers? Uh, no? So so all my representations will be complex representations. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so the sort of idea, so an idea for sort of approaching this problem due to Lustig is uh, sort of character sheaves. So the idea is to sort of care, categorify these characters and sort of define a parabolic induction over there. So how do you categorify characters? Well, a character is a function, um, a, a sort of function of the sort of conjugacy, conjugacy class of the group. So um, one can sort of take the, so this, is, this is a stack, or I'm thinking about this, uh, sorry. Um, I'm thinking about this as a stack, uh, and one can take sheaves on the stack. And to take geometry, to get sort of geometry, I'm gonna sort of um, take functions with coefficients in the complex numbers or maybe some algebraic closure of the field. So I guess I did just say I would, okay, well, anyway. Um, so, uh, okay, and the, the parabolic induction diagram for characters kind of looks like this. So one just takes adjoint quotients and you have sort of maps going the other way. And the way to pass from uh, sheaves back to functions is to use growth, growth index function sheaf correspondence. So just very briefly, I, I'm not gonna, use this in the rest of the talk, but just for, I don't know, some background. Um, right, so if one defines a variety over FQ, one can sort of extend scalars up to the algebraic closure. And when, when, when you do this, you get sort of a Frobenius action on the, on the extended variety. Um, and if I have a Frobenius equivariant sheaf, we take trace of the pullback at fixed points. And that's going to give us a function on the Frobenius fixed points of that variety, which are just the few points. So, so I have a Frobenius, if I sort of have a Frobenius equivariant sheaf, there's a natural way to recover a function on the few points. And this thing is entirely functorial. And if you just sort of do the induction along here, um, you sort of recover, right? So if you induce a sheaf here, decompose it as an object in the category, you get. Um, Sort of, you get a sort of decomposition of the corresponding character. Was there a question that I'm missing? Or... Okay. 
So Springer theory is what you get by sort of restricting to the no point locus in that in this picture. Um, so I'll go into a little more detail here. So the Springer resolution, uh, so there's sort of a standard technique for uh, sort of changing the group in the middle term from the Borel to the, to the group G. So what, what, what that standard technique is, is a sort of Borel construction where one takes a product of the variety N with G and quotients by the D action. So somehow if you were thinking about this in a stacky way, right, like if I, if I mod out by G on, on the right here, it sort of eats up this copy of G. It's going to end mod. Um, so just maybe to draw a picture. What this looks like is uh, right. So if the no for 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 G is SL two, right, the no pone cone looks like this. And these are just traceless matrices with the determinant zero. And the Springer resolution over zero. Look, you have a copy of P one, and over everything else, it's. Uh, <laughs> It's a it's, it's an isomorphism over every other point. Okay, so um, the Springer sheaf we define to be the parabolic induction of the only interesting sheaf over here. <coughs> so, in other words, that's just the push forward of the constant sheaf along the Springer resolution. So, um, these Springer sheaves, the Springer theory is somehow a historical precursor to character sheaves. Um, and if you're only interested in unicorn representations. I won't say what that means, but uh, these are sort of, it's enough to sort of study these on the no-point form. Mm -hmm. So the statement that uh, sort of we arrive at is sort of a, has a categorical flavor. So I want to sort of, uh, there, there are many different somehow uh, statements of Springer theory, and I would sort of, I'm going to opt for the categorical one by Borel McPherson. So the, the main theorem is that, that they, they can, you can compute the endomorphisms of the Springer sheaf and identify with, um, uh, uh, the, the group algebra for the vial group. And in particular, since this category is semi-simple, every sort of object is projective and one gets sort of a categorical identification. So there's um, the category that's generated by the sheaf, the subcategory generated by the sheaf is um, equivalent to representations for the vial group. So um, another way to sort of understand this is these unipot, there's a there's some subcategory of representations of this Chevrolet group uh, called the unipotent principle series. And these are, these are the representations that are generated by Borel fixed points. And the, the sort of representation theory, uh, the sort of this, the subcategory is governed by the finite heck algebra, uh, which is okay, endomorphisms of this induced representation. And there's a theorem by these four authors um, that this sort of, um, Finite hack algebra is isomorphic to the uh, finite, the, the, the group mm -hmm. algebra, the finite group. So um, the, the goal is to sort of reproduce this, these sorts of results in the affine setting. So in the affine setting, I'll let F be a non Archimedean local field. So uh, I can think of these as some kind of loop group or some chiatic group. O, I'm going to fix notation. So O is going to be the ring of integers, so the arc group or um, ZP. And what one might want to do is to study smooth representations of this group, uh, or the group, the, a reductive group with coefficients in this local field. So just for to make the notation less cumbersome, I'm going to use okay this notation. There's an analog of the Borel, which is called the Iwahori, um, and so some recent developments are um, so Professor Kamnikov, Kazan, and Barshavsky. Um, I identified sort of a, a candidate for the character of uh, affine character sheets. These are some kind of um, characters, uh, functions, or distributions on the adjoint quotient. And um, Bouvier, Kazdan, and Barshavsky sort of developed some theory of perverse sheaves and intersection cohomology to sort of get a, a result that kind of uh, looks, looks like the result that one had in the finite case. So um, what we do. Um, we don't really work uh, on this. So we do something kind of different. Uh, so one can kind of think of the sort of the work by the other, these, these, these sort of previously mentioned authors as working on the automorphic side of Langland's duality. And what we want to do is sort of um, uh, develop a theory on the spectral side. 
So maybe a very quick overview of the Langlands philosophy. Uh, so the local Langlands conjecture, it sort of um, uh, conjectures a surjection between, so on the left, I'm gonna call these things the automorphic side, and on the right, I'll call them the spectral side. So there should be a surjection between irreducible representations for these piatic groups and certain Langlands parameters. So um, I'm not gonna get into what these mean, but roughly one can think of sort of taking some elements in the dual group that satisfy some relations that are complicated. So it's a surjection, not a bijection, and the fibers are L packets. Um, I wanna suppress all this for the purpose of this talk, so I'm gonna pretend it's a bijection. Um, and there is sort of a sub problem or a sub conjecture of this um, due to doing Langlands, which was solved by Kazan and Lusik in 87, which is one could look at sort of a subcategory of irreducible representations, which are generated by Iwahori fixed vectors. So this is the analog of the principal series. And one can look at some subset of these Langlands parameters, i.e. some parameters that sort of factor through some reasonable quotient or some small quotient. Uh, and these, well, explicitly what these parameters are is they're given by a semi-simple element, a no-potent element that commute up to scaling by two. So, um, so just another result uh, that sort of falls under this Langlands duality that we'll use is this uh, the Langlands dual realizations of the affine heck category due to, due to Bezra Kamnikov. So um, what this says is there's, there's an equivalence of categories between Iwahori equivariant sheaves on the affine flag variety and coherent sheaves on the Steinberg stack. So I just want to point out there's this sort of, um, there's this R here. So this is a derived fiber product. And I'll say a little bit about what this means in a bit. And so what we want to do is, so we sort of think about the sort of theory developed by those authors as some kind of affine Springer theory on the automorphic side. And we want to study what happens on the spectral side. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, so um, uh, just a warning, I'm gonna replace G check with G because we're working on the spectral side. I don't wanna write check everywhere. And uh, from now on, the my field will be just complex numbers. And I'm gonna sort of make the assumption that this, this G on the spectral side is split and simply connected. Okay, so before uh, sort of introducing the result, there's like a bare minimum amount of derived algebraic geometry I have to talk about. So, um, so the idea behind derived algebraic geometry is to replace rings with EG rings. Um, so these are ring op ring objects in the category of chain complexes. Uh, so, so the idea here, I guess, is we we want some kind of notion of uh, resolving um, rings. So, just like how when we de define derived functors, one takes a module, uh, maybe takes a free resolution of it, and then computes um, the derived functor on the free resolution. Um, right, so one might want to sort of do a derived functor for, if, if one has a ring, one might want to apply some derived tensor product to it or something. And in order to do that, one we sort of need a sort of uh, a, a notion of a, a free resolution of rings. So this is kind of what this buys us. So if we want to take a derived fiber product of schemes, let me just say they're affine for now. Um, we can compute them using semi-free resolutions. These are sort of multiplicative analogs of the free resolution. And if you kind of keep pushing the theory, you can get some notion of derived Darn stacks. So we, instead of, so maybe just sort of a baby example, um, if I take G to be a torus, what's the derived Steinberg? Um, well, right, so somehow the Springer resolution for a torus is not, it's just trivial, it's the identity map. So I'm just self-intersecting the only notepone element with itself inside of a torus. And so what, what, what one can do is sort of resolve the augmentation module here with a causal resolution and get, and then sort of once then, and then when you sort of tensor with z zero again, or the augmentation again, it kills all the differentials and you just sort of get some shifted symmetric uh, algebra in uh, generating degree negative one. And uh, it's it's shifted so it really looks more like an exterior algebra. So this and the sort of function and, and this thing records sort of the, the tours of the augmentation module. Um, okay, so maybe I want to say a little bit about why derived algebraic geometry is necessary. So in, in Roman's sort of um, equivalence from the last slide, there's 
there was an equivalence of categories. So on the, on the spectral side, one had this T equivariant co coherent sheaves on this funny derived stack. And OK, if one sort of thinks about what that means, T acts on this thing trivially because it's by conjugation. So it's just going to be a tensor product of categories between representations for T and modules for this algebra. On the automorphic side, um, one has sort of um, T equivariant uh, sheaves on the affine Grassmannian, but the affine Grassmannian for a torus is just the co character lattice uh, for the dual torus. And this thing acts trivially. So again, we get this sort of tensor decomposition. So we have, so, right, so uh, we have sheaves on the character lattice, and that's going to correspond to representations for T. But then we have this funny thing, which is uh, the sort of sheaves on BT check. And this thing is not like somehow that this is not an, this isn't like the this isn't a the derived category of an abelian category. There's there's somehow some non-trivial derived structure which, which shows up when we take the derived tensor product on the spectral side. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, so the sort of main um, construction that we use is this um, derived free loop space. So just to recall uh, the inertia stack. So if I give you a stack, um, you can think of a stack as some somehow like a scheme with where the points have some non-trivial automorphisms. And the inertia stack is just going to be uh, the stack you get by sort of the, the points of the inertia stack are going to be points of the original stack plus an automorphism on that point. So the derived loop space is some kind of derived variant of the inertia stack um, where sort of, so one sort of presentation of the inertia stack is to take um, the self-intersection of the diagonal. Right? So somehow what this means is I take a point, two points of X, ident identify them in one way. So that's just saying they're the same point, but then I ident identify them another way, which is to include an extra automorphism of that point. And the derived loop space is what we get if we just sort of take a derived fiber product instead of a, a regular fiber product. And it's called the derived loop space because if you can also you can also kind of formulate it as some kind of derived mapping stack out of S1. So there's a way to sort of say what S1 is in the category of derived stacks or just regular stacks. And if you sort of believe that these mapping stacks have nice properties, then it should take co-products in the source, products outside, and okay, uh, sort of just so a map out of a point, a point, and a map out of two points. So the only example that we'll care about is this global quotient stack. And um, you can think of, kind of think about this as some kind of derived universal stabilizer or derived universal fixed points. Um, so what it is, is it's given by the, uh, this fiber product, but sort of maybe more explicitly the, 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 the geometric points of it. It's just gonna be a point of the, of the variety, a point of the group, such that the group element fixes that point in the variety. Okay, so if I, sort of think about it as being fibered over the group, then it's some kind of derived universal fixed points for X because the fiber over G is just the fixed um, points of G. And if I think about it as living over X, then it's sort of a derived universal stabilizer because the, the fiber over X is just going to be the, the stabilizer at that point. So um, an observation is that somehow stacks on the spectral side of Langlands are often derived loop spaces. Uh, so okay, the first bullet point here is not an example, uh, but if I input a scheme, the derived loop space is just going to be the self-intersection of the diagonal. So um, this thing is entirely derived. If I just take a classical intersection of the diagonal of the scheme, I get nothing. I just get x again. But if I take a derived intersection, there's sort of a, uh, by Hochschild constant Rosenberg, I get this sort of odd shifted version of the tangent bundle. Uh, okay, if I input BG, um, the self intersection of the diagonal, that's the inertia stack. There's no derived structure. Um, and I just get the adjoint quotient. If I sort of stick the adjoint quotient back in I, uh, to this loop space construction, I get the co uh, commuting stack. So, uh, right, what is it? mean for a group, so right. So, what, what does it mean for a group to fix, a group element to fix another group element under the adjoint action? It means that the two group elements commute. 
the growth index Springer resolution. Um, so if you restrict to the no point elements here, uh, this is you get the Springer resolution. So this is some sort of bigger version. Um, the growth index Springer resolution is also you can formulate it as a loop space. So if you take the loop space of the classifying, so this is a bad notation, but this is the classifying stack of a Borel. Then, um, right, one can kind of change the group. So this is G, uh, the flag variety mod G. And then, OK, so what does it mean for a group element to fix a flag? It, well, yeah, so this is just a pairs of a flag plus a group element that fixes it. And that's exactly the growth index Springer resolution. The Seinberg stack, or the group theoretical one at least, um, can also be formulated in this way just by taking sort of a, a fiber product. So, right, so if I take the loop, the right loop space of um, B, G mod B on sort of both sides, uh, one can sort of rephrase this as um, the product of flag, flag varieties uh, mod G, and then, um, right, and then there's sort of a property that loop space commutes to fiber products, and you sort of get this. This is the Steinberg variety, and then. Um, the sort of example, main example we'll be interested in is are these delene Langlands parameters. So, so if I take the loop space of the no point cone mod G cross the scaling GM action, what I get are triples. So I have an element of the no point cone plus an element of the group that sort of fixes that no point element. And what it means to fix the no point element is that when I conjugate, uh, it should scale by Q up to maybe uh, inversion or something. So uh, uh, maybe some more notation, just to make things less cumbersome. Uh, I'm going to have to include this GM a lot. So uh, I'm just going to use plus to indicate that I'm, add, I'm packing that onto a group. And let me just make this definition. So the so loop space, um, if I have a variety that's sort of defined over GM, I could take this like Q loop space. So what that means is, um, Okay, I, I take the loop space of X mod G cross GM, and then I can sort of take the fiber over Q, right? So this thing sits over, right, G, uh, the loop space of G BG cross BGM, which sits over the loop space of BGM, which is just GM mod GM adjoint quotient, but sort of there's a point in here, which is just Q. So I can take the fiber over these points. Um, okay, so let me sort of, uh, oops, bad planning, but right. So we have this parabolic induction diagram. So it's the same one from before, but uh, we sort of include this GM action now. And we also sort of put a dry boost space on everything. So just formally we do that. And let me sort of just draw a, a picture of sort of how, how to see this map. So in the case of SL2, what is this? look like so um so everything kind of sits over g let me ignore the gm so let me take l1 so that's just ignoring the i'll throw away the gm action for now um of the no point cone so this sits over g uh and this is sort of g where the the no point element is zero and over the unipotent cone uh, this picture is going to be very bad, but um, so over the unipotent cone, sort of over the over the sort of regular elements, it, I have sort of a one fibers, and then over zero, uh, I get another sort of copy of. Okay, sorry, the picture is really bad. Um, I get the, I get a sort of copy of n. So it, it's sort of like sort of over the, over the regular locus, it, I have some a one bundle. But then it degenerates to a, a no point cone. Um, and then the Springer resolution, what it looks like is uh, it's the same thing. Um, so, so okay, um, what this thing, this, this, this thing has two irreducible components. Oh, also, let me, I'm ignoring all the drive structure. So, I mean, there is none in this case. But, um, just, anyway, so this thing's the union of two irreducible components. One is just G, and the other is somehow. The closure of some A1 bundle on U reg. 
Okay, so what's the growth index Springer resolution? It's, it's just G tilde union, the same thing. Um, so, okay. Uh, and then if you sort of, the gen, if you sort of, okay. And then if you, uh, I'm running out of space, but if, if we take the fiber over Q, the the picture what the picture kind of looks a little bit better so somehow um, it, we still have this copy of G but the A one bundle just lives over some some regular semi simple orbit so here we, like we like we actually get an A one bundle and then uh, the picture up here kind of looks like this thing but I, I don't know you get an extra like uh, this thing is like G tilde so there's there's some sheets or something uh, okay are there any questions. Okay, so the coherent Springer sheaf, I mean, so somehow I don't really understand the geometry of this thing very well. So, I mean, I drew the picture, but I, I'm not really going to use it. Um, but we, de we define the coherent Springer sheaf as a sort of parabolic induction along this diagram. So we just take, just like from before, it's just, I mean, maybe the thing to focus on here is this. So it's just the sort of structure sheaf of the sort of looped version of the, of the Springer resolution pushed forward to a coherent sheaf on the loop space of the no-point group, no-point cone. Okay. Um, so, uh, so okay. So I need to introduce some notation. So the Iwahori Heck algebra. This is some algebra that governs the representations of um, of GF that are generated by Iwahori fixed vectors. These sort of assemble into an algebraic family over Q called the affine Heck algebra. So, uh, and those, our main theorem is that um, now, uh, just for technical reasons, I, I need to assume Q is not one just for ease of statement, but there are isomorphisms of DG algebras. Um, so the derived endomorphisms of this coherent Springer sheaf, we identify that with that affine Heck algebra as algebras. And um, there's also few versions of this statement. So uh, maybe I'll just sort of remark, this is a derived endomorph. These are derived endomorphisms, but this thing sits in degree zero. So sort of included in this theorem is sort of a vanishing result. In particular, um, well, just by sort of some formal nonsense, these are derived statements. So the subcategory generated by this coherent Springer sheaf in the derived category of coherent sheaves is equivalent to perfect modules for the affine Heck algebra. And there's also Q version of the statement. So just as a remark, when Q equals one, we do have statements that they're just not as clean so um, instead of there, there's in this case there is some funny derived structure. There's some there's some funny derived stuff, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, th there are statements there. I just don't want to write them because they're annoying. So some sort of recent progress on this in, the, in this direction. So other people have been kind of thinking about this. Um, so Eugen Hellman sort of uh, has this paper on the derived category that you were. You will heck algebra where you conjecture statements similar to ours. Um, and Tamir Himo and Shinwen Zhu are also working on this and I think have a similar statement in the forthcoming work. Okay, so um, just to outline our argument, I need to sort of introduce um, this derived Steinberg. So uh, I'll, I'll sort of set some notation for it. I'll, I'll use curly Z to denote this derived Steinberg. And what it is, is it's sort of elements of the no point cone and two Borel suffixes. Uh, that, sorry, that are fixed by it. Um, you will hurry, the affine heck category is going to be coherent sheaves on this G equivariant coherent sheaves on this derived Steinberg. And um, there's sort of a mixed variant. So if I add in the GM action, um, I get this mixed affine heck category. So this is just notation that I'm going to be using. And let me just sort of outline the argument. So it sort of, it sort of runs in parallel this, the, the work by Kazan Lustig from 87. So in, in their work, right, so what they do is they sort of identify um, the, the, the growth and group of the mixed affine heck category with the affine heck algebra. So what we do is instead of K-theory, we look at Hochschild homology, treated as a sort of categorical invariant. But the sort of extra feature that we have is that there's sort of an alternative uh, sort of presentation of Hochschild homology using geometry. So Hochschild homology, one can sort of use the sort of structure of the category to identify it with this algebra. 
But on the other hand, it's also one can sort of understand it as global distributions on some loop space. Um, okay, so the wing lang ones, um, maybe I didn't really say what this was, but it's it sort of this is some well, okay, yeah, I did. So it's some classification of um, representations of that by tech algebra, right? So if one wants to sort of classify representations of this algebra, right, one can sort of specialize as central characters. So um, Right, so the center, maybe I didn't write this. So the center of that fine Hecke algebra is identified with the growth indie group of our, uh, of B G cross B G M. So so one can sort of take points in this um, in, in in the spectrum of this ring and specialize at central characters, and uh, there's sort of a local sort of a localization picture. So when one when one sort of specializes at those central characters on the algebraic side, that corresponds in geometry just taking fixed points on the cyber stack. So there's there's some equivalence between this algebra specialized with Borel Moore homology on the fixed points of the Simon set. Sorry, are there are there questions? Sorry. Okay, so um, sort of on the loop space, on the sort of Hauptschild homology side, this is going to correspond to some sort of localization of loop spaces. So if I sort of take the fiber of this loop space, this loop space is actually fibered over um, sort of BG, sort of uh, the adjoint quotient of G plus. Um, so if one sort of takes fibers, one gets sort of loop spaces of fixed points with some sort of decoration, which I'll explain later. Um, and then Sort of the way one the, okay to get the simples, um, one can sort of do some sheaf theory. So the Borel Moore homology of these fixed points. This is the sort of derived x of some oops, uh, of some sort of uh, fixed point version of the Springer sheaf. And there's uh, sort of you can sort of run the decomposition theorem, and the, the sort of simples that the simples that sort of appear in here are going to correspond to simples of this algebra over here. So sort of the connection to the sheaf theory for us is provided. Okay, so for, for us, we sort of have this, um, the sheaf theory sort of globally. So, so, so sort of in the Deling Langlands theories uh, or for, for Kazan and Lusik, in order to get sheaf theory, they, have to, they really have to fix a, a central character. But for us, um, this, this happens globally. Right? This, thing is our, like, this thing is the global sections of some sheaf already. So, the, 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 we have an identification of the Hochschild homology, so this is the affine Heck algebra, with the X of this sort of, this sort of coherence Springer sheaf. And the way we pass to the sheaf theory is through this sort of D omega global duality, which I'll say a little bit about later. Okay, so that's the outline. Um, other questions? Okay, so the main sort of technique is to use Hochschild homology. So I sort of want to understand Hochschild homology from an abstract standpoint as a trace. So, um, so what is a trace? So if I have a, if I in a in sort of in a arbitrary sort of well in a sort of symmetric monoidal category, one can sort of formulate what it means for an object to be dualizable. So I'm going to go a little fast through this, but and then if you if you can formulate just sort of abstractly what it means for an object to be dualizable, one can sort of say what a trace is. Okay, so what the trace is, is what you, it, the trace is what you get by taking the co-evaluation, applying the, the map, and then taking the evaluation. And these traces are unique up to unique isomorphism, and they're independent of choice. So it's sort of independent of choices. And just a toy example to run is if you take vector spaces, you just get the usual trace of matrices. But um, I won't do this. Now, the, the setting in which I want to run this formalism is the sort of category is in the symmetric monoidal category of DG categories. So these are co-complete DG categories. I want functors to commute with co-limits. And the reason I sort of want to make that restriction is so that the Lurie tensor product has the correct universal property. The monoidal unit um, is the sort of, this is, uh, is a category of chain complexes. And endomorphisms, continuous endomorphisms, so endofunctors endo that commute with co-limits of this category are just given by tensor product um, with a, a chain complex. Every compactly generated DG category is dualizable by the unitive pairing. So that's um, 
So in this case, we can identify, we can define the functional homology of a DG category to be the trace or the trace of identity, or if we have a functor, we can take the trace of the functor. So this is functorial for continuous functors that preserve compact objects. And the consequence of this is that if I have a monoidal category and a monoidal functor with such that the unit is compact and um, you know, the, the, the product preserves compactness, then the Hoch homology is naturally an algebra just by functoriality. So um, sort of one can sort of treat this as a categorical invariant um, and there's a sort of algebraic model of the, these, these traces using DG Morita the theory. But uh, maybe in more down to earth terms, what that means is the Hochschild homology of the category of A modules is just computed by the usual Hochschild homology of A, which is just this sort of derived tensor product. And you can sort of use the bar complex, or if you're in a nice situation, maybe you have some causal resolution, whatever you know, uh, techniques you have, you can. At your disposal, you can just compute this using some derived tensor product. If I have a so in the in the case of a category, if I can identify a compact generator, the Hoch homology of the category is just Hoch homology of the sort of endo endomorphisms of that generator. And there's a map from the K theory spectrum. Um, I don't really understand K theory spectrum, so um, ideally, uh, I want I would like to get a factorization through. K0, the Grothendieck group. And this happens when the Hochschild homology is co-connective. Somehow, right, the K-theory spectrum lives in negative degrees. So if I knew that my Hochschild homology lived in positive degrees, it would, it would factor through the truncation. Right. Um, and the Hochschild homology, it's a categorical invariant. So it will take uh, semi-orthogonal decompositions, direct sums. And the sort of one thing we prove um, along our way to the sort of earlier theorem is we identify the Hochschild homology of this mixed affine heck category with um, the, the affine heck algebra. And also there's two versions of this statement. So the way this goes, uh, the sketch is that we sort of use Roman's argument um, or Buzzer, yeah, Buzzer Kampkow's argument uh, where, uh, right, so somehow uh, there's sort of, right, so there's sort of this equivalence of categories between um, the spectral category and the automorphic category. And the nice thing is that we have a sort of a very natural semi-orthogonal decomposition on the automorphic side, right? So this thing, right, this is, right, this is I equivariant sheaves on the flag variety, and that thing has a natural stratification by orbits. And anytime you have a stratification of some variety, you have a semi, that gives you a sort of semi-orthogonal decomposition on the category, um, just by sort of standard objects. So, um, right, so this gives us a natural basis for the, for the, for the, for the, for the K theory and the Hochschild homology. Um, but so what we have to do is we have to lift this to the mixed category uh, because this equivalence is only for right, the non-mixed category. And we, we really want to have a mixed version, uh, but okay. So there's some technical arguments, but what we're gonna do that um, we see that the Hux, we can compute the Huxley homology, see that it's co-connected, get a factorization through K theory, and, and prove that on each sort of sum and that thing's a, it's, a, it's in a place of morphism, right? So in in total, we get a map from the K theory to the Huxley homology, which is an isomorphism. So then we can just use uh, Kazan and six theorem to sort of conclude the equivalence. Okay. Um, are there are there any questions? So, um, okay, so there's a geometric, so that's sort of, I like to think of it as the algebraic model, it's somehow like how we sort of actually compute the out the, the Hoch homology, but um, we can also sort of present the traces in a geometric way. So if I take some categories, coherent sheaves or quasi coherent sheaves on a stack, the, 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 the dual uh, of this category is Q co X and there's somehow um, a theorem by Benzi, Francis, and Nadler that identifies the, the sort of um, the, the sort of du du dualizing structure on this category. So, um, right, so the tensor product of these two categories is given by quasi-coherent sheaves on the product, and we can think of these as functors from Q code to Q code uh, 
uh, via integral kernels. So there's a similar version for inco and shriek transforms, so and let me ignore the, this, these technicalities. But the upshot is that somehow one can formulate what it means, what the, what the co-evaluation is and what the evaluation is. So the, the co-evaluation is given by pulling back from the point and then pushing forward along the diagonal. And the evaluation is just given by pulling back along the diagonal and then pushing back forward to the point or taking global sections. And then, so there's, right, so if I take, if I do a derived base change or if I take a derived fiber product along this in the, in the middle here, I get the, the derived loop space. And so if I compose the co-evaluation with the evaluation, that's the Hochschild homology. And I can do a derived base change and sort of instead, right, instead of going along here, I can sort of go along the top. Um, and if I do that, what I get is, um, right, when I pull back here, it's the structure sees the loop space and I take local sections of it. So sort of using this geometric theory, one gets that the Hochschild homology of QCOX are the global function of the loop space. And in code, there's a similar story for in code, where instead of taking a star pullback, I take a shriek pullback. And that gives me sort of um, global distributions of the loop space. So the corollary here is that we sort of get an identification of the affine Heck algebra with global distributions on the loop space of the Steinberg uh, stack. But um, this is this uh, so far this thing, right? This is just as modules. So the question is, um, is an equivalence of algebras, uh, and, and, or sort of what is there an algebra structure on the right hand side, and is it an equivalence of algebras? And uh, the answer is yes. But uh, let me see. Uh, okay, I'm a little short on time, so uh, let me skip this example. But so the answer is, is yes, uh, and well, the sort of the, there's sort of a natural algebra structure on the on the loop space side given my convolution. So um, let me just sort of set up the problem. If I have smooth geometric stacks with the proper map, I can sort of set up this analog of the Steinberg. Uh, so for example, if I took the spring resolution, I just get the Steinberg again. So what's the convolution algebra structure on global distributions? So just sort of by formalism, one can sort of push around base change and um, sort of use some adjunctions, right? And just get an identification of this um, mo this module with endomorphisms for the push forward of the structure of the loop space. So if I when we specialize to this, the Springer resolution, this is this is the coherent Springer sheet. So what we find is that. Right, so um, somehow, uh, okay, so the, the only sort of maybe, so everything here is formal, and the only non formal part is to uh, identify um, these two sheaves. Um, but, and, and, and this is where we use the fact that x is smooth. But the point is somehow we have an equivalence of algebras then with the between the Hochschild homology of coherent sheaves on this um, convolution uh, stack or this, yeah, so with, and the, and the, uh, endomorphisms of the push forward of the structure sheet. Um, so one can sort of do this by hand, or there's a theory of higher traces by Gaiskari, Kazan, Rosen, and Varshavsky, which sort of, there, there's sort of theorem kind of gives this, this automatically, assuming that this monoidal category, this monoidal convolution category is rigid, which it is. So uh, maybe I did have time. So putting, put, putting all of this together, uh, what one gets is that this coherent Springer sheaf, the derived endomorphisms of it, derived endomorphisms of, derived endomorphisms of it are equivalent to the Hochschild homology of the, of the affine Heck categories algebras. Um, and then we get an identification of that thing with affine Heck algebra. So in particular, the derived category of, so the ca category generated by this thing is just Derived category of uh, modules for that type of algebra. And um, right, there's also Q versions. Sorry, are there any questions? Uh, I, I've been failing to ask. But... Okay, so um, for the 
most of the time. So somehow, right, so we have this statement, um, this categorical statement, and the question is, can we sort of recover the lean Langlands from it? Uh, so right, we have <clears throat> somehow this derived category of modules for this algebra as some subcategory of this category of sheaves. And the question is like, can we recover the Ling Langlands? And okay, so there's sort of a vague answer because we haven't really, really worked out this story, but mm. um, the, the sort of, uh, right, the, the way one might try to approach this is, okay, so in, in the sort of Ling Langlands story, they want to classify irreducible representations of this algebra. So for us, these are derived statements. Um, in order to sort of, like what, what, what one might want to do is sort of look at the Boolean category on this side and try to pick out the symbols over here. Okay, so that's maybe a goal. Uh, and okay, so the way that the lean language proceeds is by specializing essential characters. And if one does that, you get sort of this borrowed more homology of these fixed points. And um, for us, the where we think, well, there's sort of a natural way to formulate this in our setting, which is you can observe that somehow this derived, if I have a loops derived loop space of a quotient stack, it's naturally sits over G mod G. And the fiber is just the fixed points, the classical fiber. So there's a sort of equivariant localization for loop spaces philosophy here, which is that if I take a semi-simple um, point in a reductive group, then there's an equivalence between, so somehow if I take the fiber over uh, a parameter Z and maybe take formal completion there or something, then I get that thing looks like the loop space of the fixed points. So, right, so informally somehow the loop space, the global loop space of X mod G kind of looks like a family of loop space of fixed points. Um, so what is this circle? I mean, so the point is, I don't know, somehow this, this X, um, it's not exactly the fixed points, it's some derived variant of it. So if X is smooth, it's just going to be the classical fixed points. But if X is some kind of global intersection, then it, it's some derived variant. So maybe I'll suppress that detail, but yeah, the, the, there's something sort of going on there. So so this this sort of naturally, so, uh, so this localization for loop spaces gives us some kind of sheepy localization formula for Hofstra homology. So the sort of look, the sort of equivariant localization theorems one had for K theory, one has for Hofstra homology as well. And the connection to perverse sheaves um, is given by this E omega causal duality. So the observation here is that somehow functions on the loop space uh, here, X is a scheme. Right when x is a scheme, it looks it's it looks like it's some sort of symmetric algebra on Taylor differentials, but where omega one is in degree negative one. So right there's no there's no room for the internal differential to encode the drawn differential. But um, so now the drawn differential is encoded by some x one action. So if one sort of introduces that s one action, um, then uh, Right. There's an equivalence between the category of sheaves on the formal loop space of the stack with sort of uh, filter D modules uh, uh, on the stack. So, um, right. So somehow this kind of has appeared in the literature for some time by, so I think it was first studied by Karpanov and then Valenston and Drinfeld have a variant of it in their sort of um, in their book. And Besby and Nadler have a statement in their paper on loop spaces and connections. And then Hazitselsky sort of um, this sort of discusses this also in his sort of paper on co-derived uh, categories. Anyway, so and, and the sort of maybe more down the earth way to formulate this is that the, the sort of there's an equivalence of categories between derived filtered categories of D modules and some kind of category of D modules, uh, DG out, some kind of derived category or co-derived category of modules for the Durham algebra sort of viewed as a DG algebra, but it has to be sort of uh, uh, some kind of uh, deformed version of it maybe. Okay, so somehow um, putting this all together, uh, one the, the thing we wanna try to do is, right, if we sort of fix a central character 
uh, one can sort of look at filter D modules at each central character. So here I, I'm sort of, for technical reasons, uh, I want to sort of look at weekly equivariant D modules, but there should be some ver some more general version. Uh, and one can sort of also special sort of pull back this coherent Springer sheaf. And right, so there, there should be some relationship between these categories. So one should be able to push forward these D modules and roughly what this functor is, is it takes this associated graded and then it sort of pushes it forward into this sort of global loop space. And then over here, this is just sort of um, uh, some kind of for, forgetful functor uh, for, uh, or maybe forget uh, restriction of scalars. Anyway, um, right, and uh, so sort of conjecturally, this thing, this thing, uh, so this algebra should have something to do with with these graded heck out graded heck algebras. But there's there's like sort of a bunch of technical details to work through somehow um, because we're working in some filtered setting. So it's a little bit unclear, but um, like what the filtration on this thing is, or maybe not unclear, but I mean, it's not, the, the statements don't exactly match up, but um, sort of future work, sort of try to study what this has to do with graded hack algebras and try to use this to sort of study the T structures on this side and uh, maybe try to get an accounting of the simple objects. So I guess the point is somehow there's a T structure here and there's a T structure here, um, uh, but they don't line up. So uh, what we want to do is sort of transport the T structure on on the this side over to here to get some kind of maybe uh, exotic or non-standard T structure on the category of sheaves here, and to identify the simple objects using these sort of diagrams. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, so I mean that's all I had, but sort of thanks for listening. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, any more questions? I do have a question, actually. Okay. Um, I have two questions. Yeah. Um, so my first question was just kind of the naive question, which is. Of course, you know, regular Springer theory helps you to parameterize the irreducibles, uh, file group. So in your case, um, does this coherent Springer theory somehow give you more information about the representations for the affine heck algebra? Yeah, so um, I guess the, I guess sort of Kazan and Lusik already kind of, kind, of, kind of parameterized the irreducibles. So um, yeah, I mean, we, it's not like an alternative proof of their result necessary. I mean, it's not. So, uh, and, and I guess uh, maybe another comment is that somehow, um, the, the, I didn't really say this, but somehow the selling point of this statement maybe isn't to get the irreducible because somehow to like see the, the simples, um, you it's, it's good enough to fix central characters. Um, but what maybe one upshot of the statement is that uh, one can sort of see um, non-admissible uh, sort of representations of piadic groups inside of this category. Uh, right, yeah. So here, I sort of skip this a little, but um, right. So if I fix Q, you get modules for the Iwahori Heck algebra. That's just sort of principal series, principal block, smooth representations. But um, right, so somehow th th there are some sheaves living over here that aren't like that don't just sit over one central parameter and those will correspond to sort of smooth non-admissible modules uh, representations for, for the chaotic group so so i guess uh yeah so somehow yeah maybe maybe I, yeah so somehow the selling point is right if, if, you, if you want like projective mo like projective objects in the category you, you sort of somehow have to work non
Okay. Um, and my second question um, has to do with this uh, transport of the orthogonal decomposition that was necessary for your result. I'm just curious, like once you once you transported it and you can look at it, um, like I feel like it's something that you come up with without knowing the equivalence in the first place. I guess that's sort of my question. Oh, like what is the or semi-orthogonal decomposition look like on the spectral side or something? That's... Sort of. That's my question. Yeah. Is it is it intuitive and is it? I mean... um... It's it's kind of weird. I mean, it's like intuitive once you know, like, I, well, yeah, it's 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 kind of weird. Um, yeah. So like, okay, let me just go back. So I mean, you, the, it's it's somewhat it's somehow kind of known where these objects go. Uh, I forget which slide it's on. Oh wait, I skipped it. Okay, yeah, so, um, right, so, so there's, I mean, there's some objects here, right? But, so you know where the walking motors go, they just go to like, O of twists on the diagonal, and then the finite things, they go to like, um, I'm going to like mess up standard versus co-standard or something, but, and there's some twists or something, but uh, they go to like, O of, uh, I don't know, they're, 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 there's like some reduced, you know, if you, if you take like the, uh, okay, I'm gonna mess this up, but like there, there's some reduced variety here or stack here that you can kind of take and then maybe there's some twists. Um, so, so, and then I guess you can kind of formulate it that way just cause you know where those objects go, but uh, to sort of see that it's a semi, it, to, to actually like see that, that the, the Homs vanish between these things, like the, the appropriate Homs vanish between these objects, I think on the spectral side is, I think kind of non-trivial, I don't know. Um, like, yeah, I mean, somehow, yeah, I, I, I guess. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, I mean, that's sort of what I was asking because um, you made this point at the end about looking for a T structure. And in my mind, this semi-orthogonal decomposition is sort of like a huge step in that direction of finding a T structure when you don't have um, like constructible sheaves to deal with. Yeah. Um, oh, right. For yeah. So um, right. Uh, yeah, I have to admit, like, I'm mostly just confused about this sort of stuff. But like, I guess one one complication is that we like pass to a trace. So um, uh, yeah, there, there's like a and I, I don't really know how, um, how, how, how things like these T structures will behave when, like, yeah, yeah, I don't know if there's like a thing that's, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, yeah. But yeah, so somehow like the, the category we want a T structure on is like, um, is this one, whoops. Yeah, it, it, it's somehow like, yeah, it, it, you kind of like extract it. It's like the trace of this category or something. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess one could take traces of, yeah, I guess I don't know if like the semi-orthogonal decomposition here like actually gives a semi-orthogonal -orth decomposition here. I, I kind of feel like it doesn't, but I don't want to like put money on that or anything. So. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, any more questions? Okay, if this is not the case. Yeah, let's uh, thank Harrison again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for your talk, Harrison. I enjoyed it. <laughs>